Most people would say no, but even still, it's one Victorian authorities have to address. And it's all because of Paul Denyer. He's an awful man, evil beyond measure. In 1993, he randomly murdered three young women. When he was caught, he happily admitted his crimes, taking glee in the act of killing. But now, 30 years on, he's eligible for parole. Denya's already applied for his freedom once and been rejected, but there's nothing to stop him trying again, unless the law is changed. Thirty years ago, the streets of Frankston were under siege. I've heard some people describe it as almost a lockdown, except it was like a, a lockdown for women. The whole town was terrified. Under the cloak of darkness, this seaside Melbourne suburb was being stalked by a serial killer. Murders happen every day, but serial murders it's it's a phenomenon over a period of seven short weeks three young women were picked out at random and murdered without mercy he hated women and that's one of the reasons he killed them he'd been fantasizing about killing women since he was 14 years of age the killer was 21-year-old Paul Denyer, an unemployed Frankston local who would reveal himself to police as the embodiment of pure evil. Uh, Greg, can you need to push it up like that? Yeah. Fresh cloth. That looks like I'm going to time to this side. Denyer's disturbing yeah. confessions were a brutal insight into the mind of a serial killer. And it died blood away being here. I have my hands, all my hands, blood all over the place. But perhaps even more confronting than the horror of his crimes was the blasé way he described them. Without the slightest flicker of emotion, he boasted of threatening his victims with a makeshift gun and slitting their throats with homemade knives. Can you tell me where I... your tattoo on that knot? On this sort. What led to it? To send. To send a feeling this song. What, what sort of feeling can you personally describe where, where you had this feeling? Just with the one that. Just wanted to kill. It's inconceivable to the families of Denya's victims that 30 years on, the man who terrified Frankston could have any possibility of freedom. But the fact is, Paul Denya is now eligible for parole. Outrage has galvanised the fight to keep him behind bars, led by Victorian MP David Limbrick. That's what's driving us to talk about this. We don't want any possibility of him harming another girl. Do you think he will get that opportunity? Do you think he'd ever be given I don't know. freedom? Um, I don't know. No one can say for certain, and that's, that's the problem. The fear is, given the chance, this monster will strike again. What he was diagnosed with, what happened back then, what led him to kill, those elements are still present today. Forensic psychologist Carla Ferrari has pored over the letters Denya has written from the confines of his cell to help assess the mindset of this killer after three decades in jail. Is it an explanation for the savage murders he committed? Absolutely not. She sees no evidence of remorse or reform. What he has been diagnosed with, there is no treatment for. Even with intensive treatment, treatment gains would probably be modest at best. Are you seeing any gains in what you've read? No. Paul Denyer's killing spree began on Friday the 11th of June, 1993. 
Mary. On that evening, 18-year-old Elizabeth Stevens would become his first victim, going missing after getting off a bus to make the short walk home. How did she get this location? That was the challenge for us. Veteran detective Charlie Bazina led the investigation into her murder. What did Paul Denyard do? What do we know what happened to Elizabeth that night? He sees, not knowing who she was, sees Elizabeth get off the bus. It was a horrible night, it was raining. He then comes off from behind, holds a makeshift pistol that he made from a little barrel and a piece of wood, holds that to her and tells her to do not uh, scream out or I'll kill you. She doesn't scream. And she didn't scream. In the dark and the rain, driven by an urge to kill, Denya forces the 18-year-old to walk to a nearby park and to her death. I started choking up with my hands and uh, she passed out after a while. Recommend. Before we had the knife, I stabbed her many times in the throat. Denya's continued stabbing of Elizabeth long after she died, was a telling clue to his sadistic nature. Post-mortem, once she was dead, is when he inflicted a number of stab wounds to the upper body and then inflicted marks on the torso, like a big tic-tac-toe, noughts and crosses. Right. So, noughts and crosses on her torso. Mm. Was this a game? He just saw her as a piece of meat, and that's what's so chilling about this killer. As with his other victims, there was no evidence of sexual assault. Denya's deadly impulse was driven by an inexplicable loathing of women. Can you explain why we haven't met your victims? We hate them. So, after he's killed Elizabeth, Denya drags her down here and leaves her yep. in this water. She's lying there, and you spend some time looking at her, trying to recreate the scene in your own mind as an investigator. At this point, you're investigating a single murder. Yep. Initially, this is a single murder, and we treat it as such, nothing to indicate anything more sinister than that. As horrific as the scene was, for homicide detectives, this was just another routine investigation. As they were to discover, they couldn't have been more wrong. They would soon be on the hunt for a serial killer. Those words, serial killer, it's terrifying. It's, it is. It sends chills down your spine. Here we had one in our midst, in our neighbourhood. Darren Russell knows firsthand the savagery Paul Denyer inflicted on those he murdered and is convinced he should never be allowed out of jail. A 30-year-old doctor at the time, he identified the body of one of Denya's three victims. Unimaginably, it was that of his own 17-year-old sister, Natalie. You have not spoken about this before publicly. Do you feel a need to do that now? It's important that we keep talking about this, that we keep it uh, in the public's mind. He was an extremely callous, dangerous, and I don't use this word lightly, evil person. We've got no reason to believe that's changed. I walked up behind her, grabbed her with the left hand, and about, I stuck the gun to her head, yes, and um, I said, shut up, I'll blow your fucking head off. Back in the winter of 1993, Paul Denyer was only just getting started. He had the taste for blood and a compulsion to kill. Four weeks after his first murder, he tried to grab a woman walking home from work. She managed to escape. If she hadn't fought so hard, if she hadn't run, what would have happened to her? Oh, she would have been deceased. No problem in the world. But as homicide detective Charlie Bazina says, Paul Denyer was intent on killing someone, anyone, that night. Because the urge was that strong. I need to kill and today is the day I'm going to kill another woman. And he did. 
If there was any doubt, his next murder would show just how cold-blooded and evil he truly is. New mum, Debbie Frame, had left her 12-day-old baby at home with a friend while she popped to the shops, driving to the milk bar just 650 metres from her home. In that moment, Denya sees his chance and takes it. Debbie had dug down here for a carton of milk. In the one minute she was in the shop, Denya, who had spotted her as she crossed the road, sneaked into the back of her unlocked car. As the young mum jumped in to make the short drive home, she had no idea of the monster so close, the monster just lying in wait. She didn't see me in the back, probably. And I waited for her to start up the car so no one could hear her scream or anything. Threatening her with his homemade gun, Daniel forces her to drive right past her home and out into the back roads on the outskirts of Frankston. She wasn't just confronted with the torture of her own potential demise, but she was so close to home. Yep. She was so close to her little baby son who she must have been thinking, I will never see again. I mean, the torment that led up to her death. It meant nothing to him. It's like looking into the eyes of a shark. There's nothing there. It's void. And this is what this person is. And I lifted the cord up and I said, can you see this? And she just put her hand up to it, grab it to feel it. And when she did that, I just janked on her real quickly and went out her neck. And Debbie's mutilated body was found by a farmer four days later, marking a frightening realisation for police and the people of Frankston. We knew we had a serial killer amongst us and uh, that put really the pressure on us because serial killers just don't stop. Darren Russell could never have imagined that his 17-year-old sister, Natalie, would be Denya's next and final victim. What are your happiest memories of your little sister? <laughs> Probably her kind of impish um, smile and sense of humour. She was a, a gentle, good soul uh, with a good heart. On Friday, the 30th of July, 1993, three weeks after the murder of Debbie Freem, Natalie took the track she used as a regular shortcut home. Here's a 17 year old girl that went to school who never made it home. And this is the first one that Denya planned. And it's in the middle of the afternoon. As he told and showed police, Denya thought he'd calculated everything. He'd pre-cut holes in the fence to drag his victim away from prying eyes, only to return later, parking at the head of the track to lie in wait for a female, any female, to walk into his trap. But what Denya didn't know is he'd been spotted. A postal worker happens to see a motor car with an individual sitting in the driver's seat slouched down. That was suspect enough. She then went to a house and made a call to the police. Unaware police are now on their way. Denya sees Natalie Russell take the track as she heads home. He follows and quickly overtakes her and puts his despicable plan into action. So he's hiding here mm. and what, Matt walks past. And Matt walks past and he's looking out, sees her walk past and he puts himself out and comes walking behind her. Did she see him? As she turned around and waves and saw me, and I'm stuck about 10 metres behind her until I got up to the second hole up here. Mm -hmm. And just where I got to that hole, I walked up behind her and stuck my left hand around and my mm -hmm. held the knife to her throat. I won't go into details, but the savagery of it was so significant um, that he must have been in a frenzy. He then goes out, walks back to the track, to his motor car, but his hands are covered in blood. And in walking back, he tells us he sees two police officers at his motor car. What did you do? Cool as cool can be. I put my blood-soaked hands in my pocket and I walked past the police till they left. They left, I came back and I drove home. 
chilling stuff. Within a few hours of reporting Natalie missing, her family's worst fears were realized. At 10.30 last night, searchers found a young woman's body in bushland just off a bike path a short distance from her home. The police, I remember them, um, a couple of detectives coming in to pull me aside to, to let me know that they found who they thought was Natalie uh, and, and she passed away. And then my job was to inform the rest of the family. The discovery of Demi's car at the location of Natalie's murder finally delivered police a suspect. And uh, again, I'll warn you that you're not advised to say to anything unless you wish to, and anything you say to may be given evidence. Detectives swooped on Denny's home and hauled him in for questioning. The serial killer had been caught. Obviously, Natalie's death marked the end of Denya's hunting spree. How does that sit with you? That was the only little source of light that it was because of Natalie's death that Denya was caught. She did a good thing. <clears throat> Sorry. That's okay. Why does that aspect of it upset you? It's upsetting because there's the the evil that he did and there's kind of the, the good that Natalie was able to do out of an evil act. Her death meant that no one else needed to die. No other family needed to suffer. But 30 years on, Frankston is again riven by fear that Paul Denyer could walk free and kill again. He enjoyed the killings. He said that himself. Do those violent fantasies ever go away? What is your age and date of birth? 21 years old. I was born on the 14th of April, 1972. Just 32 hours after he killed 17-year-old Natalie Russell, Paul Denyer was being grilled by detectives. They were convinced they caught the serial killer who terrorised the community of Frankston for seven weeks. When we saw you down in your flat this afternoon, I noticed a number of cuts on your fingers. Yeah. Can you just um, put your hands flat on the desk here so that um, just right up here? This, oh, sorry, not, that's not too far. He still has blood under his fingernails there. Yeah. It'd have to be the case because he was actually soaked in it uh, in killing Natalie. It's yeah. quite confronting to see that, given well, we know what happened. Here you are, you know, touching the hands of, of the hands of a killer who's killed three women. Homicide detective Charlie Bazina is still in disbelief about what unfolded. During a break, more than two hours into questioning and away from the police camera, Denya suddenly confesses. And just out of the blue, I think his words were, I did the three of them. Three of what? Well, those three women you've been asking me about, I killed them. You uh, tell the detective Lockton that you were responsible for the murders of the three, the three women. Is that correct? And when we learned that, the elation was out of this world. You remember it? <laughs> oh, you okay? You know, having been at the crime scenes, what these women would have gone through, and then now to have the person who's admitting to it, our job was done basically at that stage, and then it was going to be up to the courts to convict him. I think we went to the pub about seven in the morning, had one beer. Just one beer? We're exhausted, mentally and physically. Given the gravity of his crimes, it seems unbelievable that Paul Denyer now has a shot at freedom. In 1993, he pleaded guilty to the murders and was sentenced to life with no minimum, a sentence that was overturned on a technicality, allowing him to apply for parole after 30 years. And that's what Denyer did this year, as soon as he was eligible. 
he was refused, but under the current laws, he can, in theory, apply again and again. As a criminal that you've come face to face with and investigated, how do you rate Paul Denyer? I rate him in one of the highest categories uh, of a killer that I've ever dealt with, without remorse or mercy. That's why it's so important for the government to legislate specifically to keep this killer in jail. The Victorian government has previously made so-called one-man laws to ban parole for mass shooter Julian Knight and the Russell Street bomber Craig Minogue. But much to the disappointment of his victims' families, it ruled out doing the same for Paul Denyer. Opposition MP David Limbrick was Natalie Russell's boyfriend at the time of her murder. All these years later, he's determined to keep her killer behind bars. So it seems that the fight will continue from your end at least. Yeah, until we get some sort of reassurance that, uh, you know, we're satisfied that he can't harm another woman, then we have to continue that fight. Like all prisoners, Paul Denyer is banned from writing to his victims' families. But earlier this year, he cruelly exploited a loophole to send a letter to the MP. Prisoners are allowed to write to lawyers and members of parliament. Uh, so I received a letter. In it, Denyer pleaded for his freedom. I am not a danger to society. Insisting he has rehabilitated. I will never go back to the Frankston Lane Warren area. And making the ludicrous suggestion that David might want to take up his cause. He had this idea that I might become an advocate for him, which is pretty concerning in itself that anyone might think that. Um, and it sort of just led me to believe that, you know, he really is just as dangerous now. It just shows that, you know, that lack of empathy and humanity uh, is still there. Any part of you believe that he could be reformed? I don't think so, no. This is where he starts. The letter is among one of many that forensic psychologist Carla Ferrari has assessed. She believes it reveals much about Denia's prospects for rehabilitation. There was no real evidence of change and normally you would expect to see someone explaining, you know, I've had all this time to reflect. I have, you know, spent 30 years, you know, delving into myself, what was going on at that time for me. There was none of that. I'm no expert, of course, but from what you're saying, he sounds dangerous still. I would say that's fair. In 2003, 10 years into his sentence, the unremorseful killer of women declared he wanted to be one. A series of letters penned from prison detailed how Denya identified as a transgender woman called Paula. He explains that it was something he'd suppressed for so long and then he goes on to say that, you know, committing these crimes was to try and destroy those feelings that he had, which doesn't really make, make sense because they never came up in the psychological evaluation, in the psychiatric evaluation, in the police interview. But even if he had suppressed it for all those years, never mentioned it to anyone, is it an explanation for the savage murders he committed? Absolutely not. Whether Denya truly felt trapped in the wrong body, no one will ever know for sure. But it's clear one of his goals was to be moved to a women's prison. It was a strategy that ultimately failed. And so in 2014, Paula reverted back to Paul. Well, he signed off the letter to David as Paul. Paula doesn't exist. Darren Russell, older brother to Denya's last victim, Natalie, finds that baffling. He's a doctor who just happens to be a leading expert in transgender health. He's changed back uh, and that is not a common thing for a transgender person to do. It's very unusual. So again, 
he said that he hated women and that's one of the reasons he killed them. He'd been fantasizing about killing women since he was 14 years of age. He'd been actively stalking women for some years. He's a man who detested women and now he was becoming a woman. I couldn't understand that. As the site of his sister's murder, this is a place Darren has understandably chosen to avoid. But today, to mark the 30th anniversary of her death, he's returned to Nat's track, the path that was named in his sister's honour. She would have been 47 this year and uh, you know, may have had a family of her own. Um, so it's, it's the fact we'll never have that. For all the families of Paul Denyer's victims, their loss can never be replaced. But foremost in their minds now is that this serial killer be denied the possibility of ever again inflicting the pain they've suffered. Denyer was diagnosed with a sadistic personality disorder. So he has shown himself to take, take delight in other people's suffering, in hurting other people, in tormenting other people, in torturing other people. That's how he got his kicks. We've got no reason to believe that's changed. So Daniel still remains a risk in your mind? I think history tells us that these individuals generally don't redeem themselves. And it's only when they're physically no longer capable of harm that we should be thinking of of releasing them from custody. Hello, I'm Tara.